Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, as well as Ramallah. We spoke about the report that they released on Palestinian Prisoners Day, April 17th, uh, about the conditions of Palestinian prisoners, particularly since October 7th, 2023, including in Gaza, since the invasion. More info on the group and their findings can be found at addameer.org. Then you'll hear a segment by our comrades at A Radio Berlin speaking with Johann Eriksson, an anarchist game designer who recently published a tabletop RPG called Oceania 2084 based on George Orwell's novel 1984. You can find more about the game, including a free austere PDF of gameplay, at a website listed in our show notes. That would be too complicated to read. And you can hear more audios from A Radio Berlin at aradio-berlin.org. So uh, my name is Tala Nasser. Uh, I'm a human rights lawyer, uh, uh, a Palestinian human rights lawyer. I'm based in Ramallah in the West Bank. Uh, I work with Atamir. I've been working uh, uh, with uh, Palestinian political prisoners for like six years. Uh, Atamir is a Palestinian NGO uh, that works with Palestinian political prisoners. We actually provide free legal aid to Palestinian we also monitor and document the violations committed against Palestinian political prisoners, and we raise awareness regarding this uh, important issue. And we then uh, advocate locally and internationally for uh, the prisoners' rights. So, thank you for being here. Uh, to mark Palestinian Prisoners' Day on April 17th, your organization released a fact sheet about prisoners in Palestine, particularly since the attacks of October 7, 2023, and the changes that have occurred. Um, could you talk a bit about what prison conditions and courts were like before October 7th, 2023 for Palestinians? Yeah, so like the situation in prisons, of course, uh, as events escalated, it, it has become much worse. That doesn't mean that it wasn't like this before October 7th. So uh, Palestinian prisoners have suffered a lot before October 7th. They were uh, subjected to different uh, uh, acts of torture and ill-treatment. They were subjected to uh, medical negligence in addition to uh, isolation and solitary confinement and and different policies imposed against Palestinian political prisoners. But uh, the thing is that after October 7th, the situation had worsened uh, so much that uh, the Israeli prison service had closed and isolated the prisoners from each other. They have closed, uh, 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 like they prevented prisoners from uh, talking to each other. They closed the cells of the prisoners inside every prison. They also cut off the electricity in all of the prisons uh, at the, 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 the like the, the next day, day of October 7th. Uh, also, the Israeli occup occupation forces have uh, cut the water supply. They reduced the, the water supply to only one hour per day. And uh, this means that the prisoners can only drink clean water, not clean water, can only drink water in this one hour. And uh, they, they also drink tap water, which means it is dirty. And this led to them having medical issues in their stomach and on their skin. They had skin rash and different types of uh, a skin uh, situation there. Uh, they also prevented the prisoners from going out to the yard. To the outside yard and this yard is a very small yard but they used to go for this yard before for like three to four hours and after october 7th they were completely prevented from going out to this yard now that the, now they they are letting prisoners go to the yard for only one hour per day and regarding women prisoners and some of men prisoners in in some of the prisons the showers are actually located in the yard which means that they cannot shower at any time they can only shower in this a, a very short period of time, this one hour time. And one another important thing is that the Israelis also closed the canteen and Palestinian prisoners used to buy their food and all their supplies from this canteen. Uh, the prison service uh, does not provide 
the prisoners with anything. They have to buy everything from this canteen with their own money. And after October 7th, they closed the canteen and they started providing the prisoners with two poor quality and quantity meals, very poor quality and quantity meals. And when I say poor, I mean that the prisoners have lost an average of 15 to 20 kilograms of their weight. And this this is a very uh, big number. Uh, so they, they also prevented prisoners from going to or to be transferred to the clinics, to prison clinics and to outside hospitals and clinics. And we have a lot of uh, cancer patients. We have a lot of uh, ill prisoners and they didn't take their medications at first, at first two weeks. So this led to the uh, to them, to the, to the health deterioration of their uh, of the whole situation. And uh, within all that, at first, the Israeli occupation forces announced that they are banning the International Committee of the Red Cross from visiting any of the prisons. And this is until this day. So we're talking about uh, eight months. The ICRC is not able to visit and does not have access uh, to any of the prisons. At the first two weeks, uh, they banned also the lawyers from visiting the prisons. Uh, we tried and applied to uh, to different prisons to visit the detainees there, and we were completely banned. After that, they uh, gave us permission to visit the prisons, but of course, uh, uh, w by imposing different restrictions against our visitation, which means that, for example, if, we, if I apply for a visit today, they do not give me the permission for until the next month, and this is a long period of time. Uh, another example is that uh, if I apply for a visit and then if, if the lawyer breaches the prison, they uh, ring the emergency bill and say there is emergency situation here, you cannot visit. And they do this on purpose and they did this with different lawyers and in different prisons. The third example is that if, if the lawyer reaches the prison to uh, visit this specific prisoner, they say, oh, we're sorry, the prisoner was actually transferred to another prison. And they also did this with different prisoners and on purpose, uh, they want to prevent us from documenting the torture which they committed against the prisoners because they had bruises all over their bodies and this ban will actually prevent us from seeing these bruises and documenting it uh, professionally. So this is the situation in general. So just for listeners that aren't um, that don't measure in kilograms, that weight loss that was being described um, when the canteen was closed and, and the poor diets uh, ranges between like 30 and 40 pounds. And because a lot of our listeners are in the U.S. and that's that's the measurements that's more that's more popular and understood here. Yeah. The access to water for one hour that you mentioned. Yeah. Do the prisoners have toilets in their in their cells or do they just have like a hole or a bucket or like are they able to flush refuse or um or excrement during that period of time or does that just yeah. sit for the day yes they actually have not toilets they have a hole in the ground and they they could flush but the thing is that they didn't provide them with toilet paper so for weeks they didn't have any toilet paper and of course, they didn't have also the shampoo to to shower and take take the bath. So they they don't have these these necessities. And the water is actually for drinking. So at the first months, they couldn't shower. They couldn't take a shower. At the first two to three months, none of the pris prisoners could shower. And one other important thing is that at the first day after October seven, uh, they confiscated their clothes. So they also confiscated their underwears, their clothes. So they they only stayed with the the, the thing they were wearing at this day, on the on the eighth of October. So, and they stayed like this for more than four months with their same clothes, without being able to shower or to uh, take a bath. Oh, one more question before, and this might lead into the question of um, what the courts have been like, but. Uh, my understanding is that so you were doing prisoner support work before October 7th. Obviously, uh, you've been working around prisoner issues for six years, I believe you said. Can you talk about was there a massive influx of prisoners also during this time that like following the, the 7th? And how has that impacted the conditions that people have been existing in? 
yeah, I was going to speak about that in the next question. Okay, then. Like uh, regarding the incarceration. We can go into the, the courts as you were about to. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. So regarding the courts, uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners are actually tried before military courts. Uh, the Israeli occupation imposes uh, military orders against Palestinians. So uh, that, that's why we are tried before military courts. And these military courts are actually illegal, not legal, because the first important thing is that no fair trial guarantees in these military courts. And I'll explain now how. For example, the administrative detention so the Israeli occupation forces use the administrative detention to incarcerate the largest possible number without any trial. So no administrative detainee is presented before any court. This is the first thing. The second thing is that these courts, like the judges and the prosecutors in these courts are military. They work within the military and they wear inside these courts, they are wearing the military clothes. So this is the thing also. And regarding, for example, the interpretation, there is no effective interpretation. So there is this interpreter inside the military court, which uh, who does nothing, by the way, who stays on his phone for the whole session, and like the detainee is not understanding anything because the language of the uh, court is in Hebrew. So uh, Palestinians, not all Palestinians, know this language. Very few of them know the Hebrew language. So. The detainee does not understand anything. Uh, the session takes place. The judge is speaking. The prosecutor is speaking. The lawyer is speaking. While the detainee is just like listening to words that they do not understand, and the interpreter is playing on his phone and not doing his work in interpreting. So, so that's also. So we're talking about all these. Uh, violations to the fair trial guarantee and by the way it's a uh, it's a war, war crime not uh, uh, having the fair trial guarantees inside any courts so this is the thing with military courts and that's why we at Abdamir launched a campaign against the military courts uh, and and we and we claim in this campaign that these Military courts are illegal and they are denying Palestinian prisoners fair trial guarantees, which is a war crime and which means these military courts have to end. And also children are tried before these military courts. So so the whole situation within these this whole system of the, the military occupation and the military the Israeli military courts is has to like has we have to put an end to this whole system because of its violations to to the international law. Just to sort of lay out very clearly the consequences of a military court. Um, first off, if we're talking about the occupied territories, are settlers also tried f when they're arrested under military courts or are they tried under civilian courts? Yeah, uh, so this is an important question, so no. Settlers are never tried before military courts. They are only tried before civil courts, even though they are settled in the West Bank. So they only apply military orders and they only try Palestinians before these courts. So this is this is the thing. This is here here, like we here see the discrimination, like how the Israelis try Palestinians before these military courts, which lack fair trial guarantees, while they try if they ever do and try a settler, they do that before a civil court. So he, he, here we, we can see the discrimination against uh, Palestinians within this whole system. With a military court, it doesn't sound like the Palestinians that are brought before it, let alone have, like obviously you already mentioned, do not have translation actively available to them, but they also probably don't have the right to, uh, to challenge the conviction or to have a lawyer present to advocate on their behalf. Yes, is that correct? Uh, no, they, they have a lawyer, but he, he, like lawyers can do nothing within these military courts because like the prosecutors uh, present the list of charge, which usually is regarding the freedom of, of speech, the university and union work against students and so, and then it, it's really hard for the lawyer to defend this because 
it's not actually a crime. So it's, it's, it, in its nature, it's not a crime, but in military orders, it is. So it's hard here to, to defend, to effectively defend the detainee. While uh, regarding administrative detention, there are, there are no charges presented. So the lawyer has to do nothing in this session. Uh, there is a judicial, uh, a, a judicial review session which for administrative detainees inside the military court. And in this session, uh, the judge looks at the uh, secret file between brackets because they claim there is a secret file uh, that uh, neither the lawyer nor the detainee can look at or know what is inside this secret file. And they base all the uh, imprisonment on this secret file. So the, the judge looks at this secret file, which the prosecutor is presenting to the judge. The lawyer here cannot know what is in this secret file. So how, how would the lawyer defend uh, the detainee in this case? Because no charges are presented. It's only secret. So yes, of course, it's really hard to do that. Uh, it's really hard for lawyers to uh, be present in these military courts. And that's why uh, uh, prisoners and detainees have boycotted the military courts like two years ago. Administrative detainees have boycotted these military courts because they, they are actually doing nothing except for, uh, like, they are confirming the arbitrary detention of Palestinians. Judges, Israeli military judges, are only confirming arbitrary detention against Palestinians. And that's why they took the decision once and twice, like they took it more than once, let's say, against these military courts, against this arbitrary administrative detention, and they boycotted uh, the, this judicial review session. Thank you for allowing me to ask follow-up questions. I really appreciate it. Can you speak, you mentioned children in custody and children going through these courts. Can you talk about the conditions that the children are being kept in? Yeah, so regarding children, unfortunately, this, they are imposed to the same, exact same situation as adults. The thing is that uh, children are separated from adults inside the prison, and uh, but they, they can have like one adult prisoner with them in the, uh, in the same section in the prison. So after October 7th, they isolated the, this adult prisoner and they kept the children alone with no adult with them uh, for months. And uh, they were like, they, they committed every uh, violation against children, just like the adults. They uh, raided their cells, they brutally beat the prisoners, and that happened with many children. And you know, uh, in November, last November, uh, this exchange deal took place and they released, the Israelis released 169 Palestinian children and they were, like most of them, were beaten up. Some of them were, uh, like we saw on the cameras and we saw them in person, have bruises all over their bodies. Some of them had no shoes when they were released. So it's really horrible, the situation in prison. And of course, for children as well, because they are, like, they need special attention. They need special treatment. And this, of course, does not happen in Israeli prisons. And they have to face different kinds of of uh, and acts of torture and ill-treatment. And when we're talking about Gazan child detainees, the, the, the situation is much more horrible, actually, because some of them are still uh, forcibly disappeared. Uh, we don't know where are they, where are they holding child uh, prisoners from the Gaza Strip. And we know that the situation is really horrible because we've been documenting with many released prisoners regarding this issue. And uh, we know uh, how they are not allowed to sleep, how they are 24-7 handcuffed and blindfolded, how uh, they only provide them with very thin mattresses, like two centimeter mattresses to sleep on for only three hours, and then they take back the, the mattress. And so so children are, uh, uh, are subject to all these inhuman uh, acts and all these inhuman and crimes, uh, which is really alarming, actually. Yeah, that really is. Um, I guess shifting over to, um, you had mentioned that prisoners who were being detained, who had cancer, who were taking medications, or maybe who had other health concerns, have been denied their medications. 
the report that Adamir put out talked about a number of deaths in custody, particularly since October 7th. And I'm sure a number of these are due to the denial of medical care. Could you talk a bit more about um, the generalized conditions and um, especially for infirm or elderly or injured people? Yeah, so after October 7th, just like I said, the Israeli uh, prison service and Israeli special forces raided all the prisons and all the cells, and they started brutally beating the prisoners, regardless of their age, regardless of their uh, health situation, regardless of of their sex, regardless, regardless of anything. And all these beatings and torture have led to the killing of 18 Palestinian political prisoners inside the prison. And this number is alarming. This this number is unprecedented within this very short period of time. And uh, most of of these deaths were due to the torture and ill-treatment. And I'll speak about about this now and then uh, move to the medical negligence, which led to the killing of another one. So regarding torture and ill-treatment, the Israeli occupation forces opened an investigation regarding five cases of the killed Palestinians inside the prison. And they did uh, the, uh, the autopsy examination for these five cases. And the initial autopsy reports show and confirm that they were brutally beaten. They were tortured. They had bruises all over their bodies. Uh, they had fractures in different parts. Of and they were most of them were internally bleeding due to the beatings and torture, which killing. So the initial reports confirmed that. Uh, we're still waiting for the investigation to, to continue. But uh, it's important to note that we've been working for more than 30 years with this Israeli system. And we know that they always, like 99%, 99% of uh, the, the uh, complaints or the investigations opened by the Israeli authorities end up closed, claiming there is no not enough evidence. So we are really afraid that this will happen regarding these five cases. We are afraid that they will also close the investigation claiming there is no uh, 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 enough evidence while there are these important autopsy reports which confirm all the torture and brutal beatings. And uh, now, regarding the medical negligence, there is one important case of this prisoner which is called Walid Dakka. Walid uh, was sentenced at first to life imprisonment. He holds, by the way, uh, an Israeli citizenship. So he was uh, sentenced to life imprisonment, and then it was reduced to uh, uh, 36 years imprisonment. He, he, he actually, like, he, he was in prison for 36 years, and after that, they charged him again for smuggling phones, like he had to be released, okay? But then they charged him of smuggling phones inside the prisons because prisoners do not have any access to their families uh, only within these smuggled phones inside the prison because they are not allowed to speak with their families. So uh, he was charged of that and they added two years to his 36th year. And then he was diagnosed with a very severe bone marrow cancer and he didn't have his, uh, uh, his uh, medical, he didn't get enough medical care and he, they didn't give him the uh, effective medication, which led to his killing. So after 37 year imprisonment, uh, and he was supposed to be released a year before, he died inside the prison. And until this day, they are not releasing his body. Uh, they are still uh, imprisoning the body of Walid Dakka. So this case actually shows the brutality of the Israeli uh, occupation forces and how they deal with ill prisoners and with and after this very long period of time of imprisonment, they did not allow, they did not release him. And we tried, lawyers tried, we did all these campaigns, we did the legal work in order to release him to die between his family, to die in his house. That We knew he would die. So we wanted him to die in his house, but this didn't, didn't happen. So, so 37 years in prison, and then he dies in prison, and now they are not... Uh, giving his body back to his family. So this also shows uh, how how the Israelis deal with 
uh, ill prisoners, and we have hundreds of cases of ill prisoners uh, who are not getting their medication, who are uh, uh, neglected medically, which will for sure lead, lead to them, uh, uh, to their death inside the prison. There, you mentioned before the um, the fact that prisoners are unable to keep clean because the showers are difficult to get to or because water is not available, shampoo is not available. Um, people are being denied further clothing and kept for months in the same clothing they were arrested in. Uh, they're similar to the sort of uh, inhumane and degrading treatment uh, that is described there. There was much footage of civilians since the invasion after October 7th of Gaza of civilians being held in the streets in their underwear, tied and held captive by Israeli occupation forces, an obvious act of humiliation. Um, has your organization documented, uh, well, you've already talked about torture, but um, there are reports that have come out about the use of sexual assault and um, extrajudicial executions of prisoners by Israeli captors. I wonder if you could talk about this documentation that your organization has. Regarding the whole situation of Gazan detainees, so after the ground invasion took place, uh, the Israeli forces began conducting massive arrest campaigns. And the thing is that until this day, after eight months, we still don't have accurate numbers of arrests. Uh, we have no information about these prisoners inside the military camps. The only thing we know that the Israelis announced that they opened two military camps to hold Gazan detainees. One military camp is called Sdeitimam, and it's in the south. The other one is called Anatot, and it's near Jerusalem. So they only announced that they opened these two military camps to hold Gazan detainees. Of course, the International Committee of the Red Cross is completely banned from visiting these military camps. We as lawyers are completely banned from visiting these military camps. And like we get a lot of requests from families asking about their loved ones. They have no idea. Are they killed? Are they imprisoned? Where are they? There are hundreds of missing Palestinians. They are forcibly disappeared. The Israelis are imposing the crime of enforced disappearance against Gazan detainees. And we, we, we try to contact, of course, not only we at Abamir, but different Palestinian and Israeli uh, organizations to contact the Israeli authorities to disclose any information regarding Gazan detainees but they were not responding at all. And this is until this day. So we're speaking about this whole isolation against Gazan detainees. And within this situation comes the Haaretz newspaper uh, and publishes three articles regarding Gazan detainees in these military camps. And this is the only way we are, like, they are revealing information that we never knew. And we only know that from these Haaretz uh, uh, publication. So the first one, the first article was regarding the whole situation in the military camp, and it revealed that uh, Gazan detainees are 24-7 handcuffed and blindfolded, and that they, they only sleep for three hours on very thin mattresses, and that they have to stay all the, the time on their knees. So they cannot sit up straight, they have to stay on their knees while they are blindfolded, and handcuffed. So it only revealed this little less information that we didn't have before. So then comes the second article, which revealed that more than 27 Gazan detainees have been killed inside these military camps. And unfortunately, until this day also, we still don't know their names. We have no idea about the names of these 27 who were killed. And of course, we don't know the circumstances behind their death. We only knew that from this Haaretz newspaper. And we are pretty sure that the number is so much bigger because, and th this will going to be revealed like after this genocide ends. So, and the third article was like before two months, it was, uh, they interviewed a doctor who was working in one of the military camps. and. He said that he had to amputate the limbs of many Palestinian detainees 
because they are 24 7 handcuffed and feet cuffed and this led to an infection in their hands and feet and he had to amputate their hands and feet due to that so so he was talking about the cruelty he was talking about all this horrible situation in there they are restrained for a very long period of time which led to this medical issue of infection and so so and yes we have oh, all of this we knew it from these articles and then they started releasing some of the gas and detainees uh I, I tell you it's really hard for us to get to have full access to release the detainees from the gaza strip because of the genocide still taking place uh they actually they go out from prison looking for their families most of them their families are killed uh the other ones were displaced so it's really hard for us to do that but we did with some of them we documented cases of released prisoners and they all confirm all these harsh uh, uh treatment all the torture all the ill treatment and one other thing regarding gas and detainees is that uh at at first, the Israelis amended this unlawful combatant law. So the uh, Israeli authorities are actually applying the unlawful combatant law against Gaza. And this law is actually similar to the administrative detention law, which means they can arrest Gaza without presenting any charges against them, without any trial, and it can be renewed indefinitely. The detention order can be renewed indefinitely. And they amended this law that they allowed the ban like they they banned the detainee the detainees from meeting with their lawyer for for a period of 180 days which means six months we as lawyers cannot visit or meet with the detainees and why is that this is because they want to prevent us from documenting all the torture committed against them so it was at the first six months it we were completely banned from visiting because of this amendment. Now, some lawyers have access to some gas and detainees in prisons, not in military care. They also confirm the very heinous and cruel treatment against gas and detainees. They let them bark. Like, if you want to have food, you have to bark. You know, like they are treating them just as dogs and they are asking them, forcing them to bark. And if you don't bark, you get beaten up hardly so and they every day they raid their cells and they brutally beat them this is every day in addition to the uh, humiliation just like i said the barking the uh they are not allowed to shave their beard or head uh they are not allowed to uh of course go out to any yard of course not nothing at all they are enduring severe conditions very hard conditions and really the situation is really hard with gathering detainees they are uh, uh imposing punitive measures against gas and detainees they are all civilians they have they have nothing to do they are all imprisoned without any charges presented against them and they are only doing all these acts and committing all these acts as punitive measures against uh gas and detainees because of the political nature of prisons under the Israeli occupation, when you or Adamir are using the term political prisoner, are you referring to anyone who is arrested because of their identity as a Palestinian? Or is there a specific other group or um, delineation that you're making with the term political prisoner? Yeah, so yes, we refer to every Palestinian uh, uh, arrested inside Israeli prisons as, Palesti as political prisoners because uh, the Israelis are trying and aiming to silence Palestinians by putting the largest number, possible number of Palestinians behind the bars. So, and they, they do this in order to prevent the Palestinians from raising their voices against this illegal occupation, against this ongoing genocide, and against all the crimes uh, still taking place against Palestinians. So, uh, every Palestinian inside these prisons is a political prisoner. And uh, like the Israelis are uh, are committing the crime of persecution against Palestinians, they are trying to put all Palestinians behind the bars, and by doing that, they are trying to they like they do not want to see any Palestinian 
uh, rejecting the occupation or uh, resisting this occupation or uh, speaking up about this occupation. You know, they are using the charge of incitement against many Palestinians now. So if you're a journalist and posting anything as a journalist on your social media, let's say, or on a radio episode or, or whatsoever, they can arrest the journalist for speaking up again regarding this issue. And uh, if you post any words of sympathy towards our people in Gaza, I might be imprisoned because of these words of sympathy. So they are imposing all these measures. They are uh, trying to silence Palestinians by charging them on charges of incitement, by uh, putting them under administrative detention without charges, and by uh, imposing uh, even the military, these military orders, which ha have to do with all like with all our lives, they, they are trying to control all our lives and they are uh, doing that and aiming to impose further control and further repression against Palestinians. Yeah, so university students across the U.S. and in other countries around Europe, for instance, have increasingly been occupying their campuses and facing violent attacks by police or Zionists of various types. Um, for these protests in, in support of, of Palestinian liberation and an end to the war and the occupation. Do you have any messages for those who are continuing um, their protests either in the streets or on the campuses? Yeah, of course. Uh, at first, uh, we as Palestinians, and I, I might here speak on behalf of them, thank all the students worldwide, all over the world, who are uh, taking this or, or, or doing these efforts in solidarity with Palestine from the bottom of our hearts. And it's really important for them to know that we see everything and this we are sure that this will make a difference because we know that students are the ones who are going to make the difference in this world. And uh, yes, every little thing they do and every big thing they do, everything matters for us and everything will make a difference. So. We encourage them to continue, of course, with all the solidarity. Uh, of course, it's really important to also uh, highlight the boycott, to boycott this uh, uh, illegal occupation. And uh, we know that they call for that. They always call for that. So raising this issue, the Palestinian uh, uh, cause, is really important worldwide. And of course, taking actions and steps towards ending this illegal occupation is also important. And like, uh, so like, yes, we see everything they do and we like, our hearts get big with all the videos we see, with all the pictures. And it's really important for us and it gives us hope that we will uh, get rid of, from this illegal occupation and this uh, settler, settler colonial regime, which is imposed against Palestinians since 76 years. So keep up this work, keep up the protesting, keep up occupying the, the universities, and of course, boycotting Israeli universities and boycotting this whole Israeli system, this whole uh, uh, occupation. And of course, like resisting in, in different ways is really, in, and in all means, is really important in, in our struggle in order to achieve victory, to finally achieve victory uh, against this uh, uh, brutal occupation. Have the lawyers and um, workers and volunteers at Adamir faced repression for speaking out and doing the the reporting and advocacy that you're doing? Uh, no, not yet. But it's important to note that uh, three years ago, the Israeli occupation authorities designated Adamir, along with other six organizations, as a terrorist organization. And uh, they they did this designation because of our work, because we speak up uh, regarding the prisoners' issue, and because uh, because we document all the uh, violations against prisoners. Uh, and of course, it was based on a secret file, so they had no charges against my organization. They had nothing to say except that uh, this organization is a terrorist organization. And of course, we've been working for more than thirty years with Palestinian political prisoners, and. Uh, we know that our professional work led to this designation. So now we are not facing anything at the meantime, but uh, 
we might face in the future, of course, because we are designated as a terrorist organization, but we managed to continue with our work because we know how important this is and how this uh, issue of Palestinian political prisoners is important to every family in, in Palestine. And I guess the last question is, how can people learn more and support the work of al Adamir and others working on the prisoner issue in Palestine? Yeah, you know, we 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 always speak up. We do all these webinars, all these teach-ins in different universities, in different countries and so. And it's also important to follow our work on our website, abdamir.org, and on our social media platforms. We have a page on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter. So we publish everything there and, of course, uh, uh, on our website and anyone can look for anything. And, of course, uh, anyone can contact us uh, at our email and uh, ask for anything. And, of course, we'll be ready always to answer for any of the, of the requests. Talen Nasser, thank you very much for having this conversation. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you for all the work that you and Adamir are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح ما بدي من كل لكم خلع ولا لا 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 بدي ملبوس بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح ما بدي من كل لكم خلع ولا لا 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 بدي زنار بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح إلا غزال للي ذي جوان للي كم محبوس بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح إلا غزال للي ذي جوان للي كم ميدوم بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح يا طالعين عين للجبل يا مول الموكدين النار بين لليمن يامان عين للهنا يا روح The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts and here's a jingle from another member of CZN <laughs> The Anarchist Radio Berlin. From across the pond. It's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish, and German. And please, don't mention the war. Check us out at genocero-network.com or aradio-berlin.org. So we're here with Johan Eriksson, an anarchist game developer based in Sweden, who recently published a new role-playing game called Oceania 2084. Hi, Johan. Uh, hi, hi. Yeah, as a start, uh, can you tell our audience what role-playing games or short RPGs are in a few sentences, if possible? Yeah, I'll try to do this justice. So role-playing games can be seen as like collaborative storytelling games where you sit down around a table, you bring up a rule book, you have a couple of papers on the table, which are your character sheets, and um, you collectively imagine a world that's not our own. And you uh, live out what you think that the characters that you're playing as, how they would react in a certain situation, There is often a play of the game that is called the game master. That is the one like conducting the scenes and playing everyone who's populating this fictional world that is not a player character. It's in essence, the way I usually see it is if we're talking about the, what a role playing game is in the land of literature, I, I tend to see it as like a, a rule set that creates fiction or allows for the creation of fiction. I guess that's as clear as I can be in a short amount of time. Amazing. That was uh, really concise. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so the title of the game, of your new game, is Oceania 2084, which mm -hmm. already seems to tell us about what this game is about. 
Mm -hmm. Can you dive a bit more into the world of this RPG? Yeah, sure. Um, so a bit of backstory before I do that, though. This game came out because three different conditions were met. One was that I was developing another system called Control, which basically is like a, a, a role-playing engine for any type of game where keeping face would be important. I was actually thinking about Jane Austen drama, romantic drama things when I was writing it. I have my background within anarchist uh, movements uh, in Europe. That was condition two. And I read a Reddit thread, <laughs> which basically was a poll, which said that no one will ever make a good role-playing game out of George Orwell's 1984. So I thought to myself, well, I need to do that then, <laughs> apparently, because that's the type of masochist I am. So I started developing this game and I based it on that control system uh, that I had written in parallel. The world of Oceania 2084 takes its main inspiration from George Orwell's, Orwell's book 1984. And it kind of remixes it or it's a retake on that fiction. It's not a continuation of what Orwell wrote. Instead, I'm thinking along the lines of what would happen if Orwell would have been alive today, participating in the conversations that are around right now and writing a similar dystopian vision for our near future. What were, would be the things that would be brought up then? And then I created this game on that premise, basically. It is a game about totalitarian uh, oppression. It is a game about who we are, if we're living within that. It's a game about surveillance systems and the power that that has over us and our social movements. It's a game that is anti-authoritarian and anarchist at its core, because it's it's bottom line is that we do resist these things, not because we always can win, but because it's the right thing to do. Resistance is a mode of life, basically. Yeah, I think that's as clear as I can get about that I, at this point. Yeah, I think we will get to some of those topics later. In Orwell's original 1984, nothing ever changes fundamentally. It, does this apply also to your world? Um, and as it is also based in 2084, is it also a sci-fi game? Yes, it's a sci-fi game. But I've, as Orwell also did, kind of toned down the technology fascination of sci-fi because it's not really about the, the technology. It's about the social relationships in a sci-fi world, right? So instead of going into like defining exactly how the devices in the world work. I've just written devices and encouraged the, the different gaming groups to imagine what that would be in their world, their iteration of this. Uh, what was the first part of the question? If this never changing thing also applies yeah. to your game. Yes, it does. There is one principle of the game, and that is that uh, resistance characters or the resistance players, will never topple Big Brother within the game. This is a story about the downfall of these individuals. But it's not the story of the end of resistance, because the whole game is about leaving hope and notes and messages for future resistance movement fighters. So there is a part of the game, which is the epilogues that you, you go through after you've finished a campaign, which allows you to imagine what happens after the game, what happens after this thing that is technically kind of outside the game. Yeah, it depends on how you want to see that. But in pure gameplay, you will never topple Big Brother. And that is basically enforced by how the rules work. One part of this is that the game is a constant tug of war uh, between the resistance players and the player who is playing as Big Brother. And that tug of war is over narrative control of the world. There are certain parts of the world that Big Brother will always have control over. Big Brother will always have control over the thought police and the higher up governmental areas. There is no way to win in those areas because Big Brother has narrative control over them. But everything else, everything below that is contested, so to speak. 
Yeah, I, I noticed this uh, apparent contradiction between the collective wish of living freely and without oppression, as you say in the book, mm -hmm. and uh, the not being able to crush the system. Yeah. To put it like that, find it interesting your epilogue solution to that <laughs> to that problem. I also had the impression that uh, you were trying to like counter the power gaming or maybe heroism aspects of other more traditional games. Definitely. This is a very concrete design goal for me because I wanted to stay true to Orwell's way of writing about Winston in his case, because he has one protagonist. Winston is a bit of a, a, a bastard, to be fair. Uh, he's not just a bit of a bastard. He is emotionally stunted and does horrible things in the book. That flawedness or that this is not a hero is central even in the way that you create your characters for Oceania 2084. You have a set of values attached to your character, basically moral values or like convictions, you can call them. There are three national values and then there are a bunch of personal values. These national values, when you create your character, you will create a character that actually stands by two of them and, and supports the state in two of these clearly oppressive ideas. But there is one of them that your character will see as the break in the illusion, so to speak. Like That's where they see that something is wrong. So you will play characters who are actually part of the world that we're, you're imagining. You're not going to be playing as this fantastical hero within this world. Yeah. So before you already mentioned that a reason for doing this uh, game was this Reddit challenge, let's call it <laughs> that. Still a question comes to mind, why develop a game with such a dystopian setting? So taking the question, isn't the world dystopian enough? Yeah, it is, but a lot of people don't realize this, especially when we're looking at the, the, the gaming community. There tends to be this keep politics out of my games type approach. And I actually think games is a really powerful tool to bring out our actual feelings around things and actually get conversations that we really need to be having started. My hope is that this will infiltrate everyone's gaming groups but of course it's not gonna it's a niche game but it's it's literally what i would like it to do so that people who are not really thinking about these topics like surveillance or oppression or what freedom actually means would start thinking about this in a group setting and deal with it because i think that's paramount to the challenges we're facing right now with increased repression in society and and uh, increased everything that's bad all the authority authoritarian things right so for me it's a political reason to make this game perfect thanks a lot so let's say people are now motivated to try this out what is needed to play the game three people is the minimum number of players you need that means two resistance players and one big brother player. You cannot play it on two players because it becomes really weird in a few of the mechanics, but you can play it solo. So you can actually pick it up and play it by yourself. It's a slightly different game if you do that. There is a, an additional rule set that I published around that. You need the core rule book. It's already available for free on itch.io. So you can search for the name of the game on itch.io and, and find it as a downloadable PDF. And there you'll also find all the character sheets. You will need a set of polyhedral dice, that is role-playing dice, basically, which has more faces than six. One set of those is what you will need minimally to be able to play. And then you need uh, a pen, a, an eraser, a room to be in, perhaps, could be good, a table, yeah. And uh, some trust among the players, I would say. Yeah, that sounds good and also comes into my next question um, because you already also included some guidelines on how to play it or maybe how to care about the well-being during the game. Yeah, so I'm including to start with the game in itself, its game mechanics and the principles that you abide by when playing are already doing a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to scaffolding or dealing with what types of oppression you'll face or things like that. It's included within, for example, character creation or world setup things. But in addition to that, I also link to a bunch of resources 
that are uh, a, a collection of safety tools around role-playing games. Lines and Veils comes to mind, X cards comes to mind, and I'm leaving it very open to which of these that you may or may not use at your table. Personally, I think I would prefer play the game with friends that I know well enough to trust that they won't try to traumatize me for real and that there will be an ongoing conversation around this and that there is no like uh, stigma around that. But that's not the case for all gaming groups. It's not the case for all friend groups even. Then I really recommend using some kind of safety tool. I have one addition there, I realize. In the upcoming uh, Kickstarter campaign edition of the game, I've also included an extra chapter that I might pr publish for free later on, which is a debriefing chapter, which would be a voluntary addition to any longer campaign or, or game session where you feel you've touched upon really heavy stuff. So you can help each other like debrief and care for each other after the game. That's also an addition that I've made. Sounds good. In the game, there's also a disclaimer that the game is actually not for everybody. Some people are explicitly excluded. Can you yes. tell us more about this so-called Olivia Hill rule? Of course. Uh, the Olivia Hill rule for me is kind of a joke, kind of not a joke. The Olivia Hill rule bans fascists from playing the game. That's literally what it does. And it does so in a kind of, it's, it's making jest of, it, it's a rule, but it's really, an, you can't enforce the rule, right? <laughs> If someone picks up the game and they're a fascist, of course they can play it. But having that in the book for me makes it feel like, I'm at least making some kind of statement around this is my toy. <laughs> this is for this is for the betterment of of humanity away from fascism. If you're a fascist and playing this game, why are you playing this game to start with? <laughs> why would it be interesting to you? But also, I don't want you to. I don't want you to have fun with the thing I made, right? Uh, that's that's the Olivia Hill rule basically. <laughs> yeah, amazing. It should be in every game anyway. Yes. <laughs> Um, besides the base game that you already published online, as you said, you're now also doing a crowdfunding. Uh, tell us more about this, please. Yeah, the crowdfunding campaign is... Okay, so let me start with this, because I know the listeners of A Radio Berlin. For me, I never really wanted to sell the game. I give it out for free, the full rule set, because I actually think that it should be free. But I am also human <laughs> with... <laughs> emotions and I would like some recognition for things. So I imagined like this idea that maybe people would be interested in having a collector's edition that they can put on their shelf and actually like give something back to me. I've spent four years developing the game. It's been like a passion project. Personally, I just want to have the book. <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to, to give out the book so I could have the book. That's, that's as honest as I can be about this. So the Kickstarter that is up right now is trying to get 500 copies of the book printed. That's the goal of this campaign. In order to do this, there needs to be a bunch of money. And I don't have a bunch of money. So that's why the Kickstarter exists. If I had the money on my own, I would have just printed the game. But now we're here and I'm running a Kickstarter and it's a lot of work and it's uh, stressful. And I have to kind of compromise with everything I stand for every day right now, which is, oh, it's harrowing. But it's also kind of fun because it means that I'm, I do get to do this type of interview and I get to talk about the game and it's, it's becoming more known for every day. So for me, even if the Kickstarter actually doesn't end in a, a reached goal this time, it's been very, very good uh, in many ways. The book that's going to be published is a hardcover book, uh, quality printing at a Polish printer committed to good environmental things. And it's going to be uh, around 200 pages, A5 format. And a friend of mine, Mika Edström, is doing all the illustrations uh, for the book. I'm doing all the typography and photography and layouting and design of the, the, the book itself. That's kind of what it is. I also have one, like the, the most expensive Uh, pledge reward for the campaign is the academic interest pledge, which also includes my master's thesis I wrote around the development of the game. That's for me personally just fun if people want to read. It's also available for free online. So it's basically just a way of pledging more money and getting something back for it. And what is the deadline of the Kickstarter? The 10th of May is the final day, 10 in the morning on the 10th of May. 
that's when the campaign ends. And hopefully it will pick up speed <laughs> and I will reach the goal. I don't know. Yeah. So maybe some of our listeners will be interested. Mm -hmm. In any case, we will have the link to the Kickstarter also on our website at aradio-berlin.org. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't spoken so far? Hmm. That's a good question. I have spoken so much about this game in the last weeks, so my brain is a bit of a jumble. However, I think even if you can't afford the game in the Kickstarter, you can still help the campaign by sharing it with anyone you think would be interested in it. And it would help so much. I'm on a zero budget for marketing and I'm doing word by mouth mostly. Yeah, anything to get it in front of more people will help me so, so, so much. If it gets to its goal, there will be a bunch of books that have not been claimed by the pledgers of the campaign. Those books will be sent out to info shops around Europe and made available through that network. That's my goal with this. I think that's it. <laughs> Amazing. We look forward to seeing those copies and uh, yeah, good luck. Yeah, thank you. If you want to support the Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. For the sake of anyone in the office of Attorney General of Ohio, if they're listening, this segment is political satire. We feel it necessary to make this disclaimer as they referenced a spoof press conference for Sean as governor in exile of Ohio on the January 18th, 2015 radio segment in court filings to prove how dangerous Sean is, while actually just showing how stupid they are. Check out our show notes for a link to the inauguration announcement. In response to the demands of thousands of savage cannibal Swainiacs out there, well, at least five really loud ones. I'm going to make it official. I'm running for President of the United States in 2024. I think this is finally our chance to abolish everything. The Republican Party has nominated a perennial loser who is more unpopular than popular even with Republicans. The Democratic Party has nominated a bag of bones who is also more unpopular with his own base than popular. This means that both corporate parties have conspired to accomplish something I couldn't do better. Reveal to the entire American public why hierarchic electoral politics really sucks. For the first time ever, we've got rich white octogenarians at the top of both tickets that nobody wants to vote for. RFK Jr., a third-party guy who runs barefoot on planes, thinks the COVID vaccine is the beginning of the zombie apocalypse and recently revealed a worm infestation in his brain, is polling at 15%. Surely, if a guy with brain worms can poll at 15%, I have a chance. As everyone listening to this show can attest, I've got nothing in my brain. You can take x-rays of my skull, and you won't find anything in there. I'd make the perfect president. As the presidential field currently stands, commentator Charlemagne the God has characterized it as a choice between crooks, cowards, and the couch. The crooks are the Republicans, the cowards are the Democrats, and the couch appears to be the winner, as most people sit this one out. And so, here I am. I'm a bullet through the brain pan of the body politic, a needle in its veins, an enema in its clogged and filthy bowels. So I need you to pull that trigger, punch that syringe, and jam me up its ass, and let's get rolling. I don't want to be the next president. I want to be the last president. I've recorded a series of campaign videos now available on Instagram at Mongoose Distro, and soon available at Real Sweeney Act 1969, explaining why I want to abolish everything. The United States was an experiment in democracy. 
democracy, and it has failed. It's time to end it and move on. We can abolish the federal government entirely and return power back to you to decide how you want to live. No more cookie-cutter standards imposed on hundreds of millions of people with diverging interests and priorities. We can abolish the national debt all at once by abolishing the United States. It's the federal government that owes back that money, not us. And quite frankly, just as a practical matter, the existence of the federal government represents non-freedom to all of us. Think about it. You've got a municipal government telling you how to live, a county government, a state government, and a federal government. You have four layers of supervision you never asked for, and you pay for all of it. You have a supervisor, and a supervisor to a supervisor, and a supervisor to a supervisor to a supervisor, and a supervisor to a supervisor to a supervisor to a supervisor. To a supervisor. All of them tell you what to do. All of them reach in your pocket to make you pay them for making you do what you don't want to do in the first place. Elect me president, and I won't be telling you what to do. In fact, elect me president, and no president will ever boss you around again. We can all dance naked around a bonfire where the White House used to be. None of this was ever legitimate in the first place, even according to its own laws. Indigenous tribes still own 35% of the U.S. land base, and another big chunk was simply stolen from Mexico. I will soon roll out a comprehensive plan to decolonize the United States. We'll sell off the aircraft carriers and other weapon systems on eBay and give control of the land back to the people who were here first. We'll have mass deportations, more than under Biden and Trump combined. We just have to find a country willing to take hundreds of millions of crazy white people with Bibles and guns. I'm the only presidential candidate that's this tough on illegal immigration. I'm going to enforce it going all the way back to 1492. Pack a bag. We're lining up the cruise ships. We've reached out to the campaigns of each of the dusty fart bags running against me, but they refuse to allow me to participate in the debates. I don't blame them. Their ideas are as old and tired and incoherent as they are. So I'm proposing something else, something that former Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani once suggested. I'm invoking... Trial by combat. We can settle this election in the ring. Biden and Harris, Trump and whoever, all four of them against me. A no-holds-barred, submission-only, tables, ladders, and chairs cage match. Four on one, just to make it fair. I will superplex Trump off the top turnbuckle, then wake up Sleepy Joe just to put him back to sleep. It used to be, that leaders were selected by their ability to pull a sword out of a rock or their skill with a slingshot in killing giants. Modern times as they are, we should just get in the ring. Want to abolish the United States and electoral politics forever? I need your help. Check out all my videos and repost them. Tell your friends. Email the Trump and Biden campaigns and demand they join me in the ring. Trial by combat. I'll soon be down to my fighting weight. I'm ready. And of course, the more visible you make my campaign, the greater the chances that I'll get the approval of the people who really matter in this election. That's right. Russian trolls. The ones who can hack the Venezuelan voting machines and give me 100% of the vote. We need to convince my Russian friends, Boris and Natasha, to take a chance on me. Let's tear it all down once and for all. Abolish everything. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the super duper uber mega ultra hyper turbo multi maxi max in Youngstown, Ohio. Write in candidate for president in 2024, and I approve this message. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org This is the Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com.
If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.